Welcome back, Fight Fam and Fight Systems. So today I'm going to be doing a review on one of the most inspiring people to me. And that is going to be Yemua the Bull. Now, if you don't know who Yemua the Bull is, he is a Hmong Muay Thai fighter. One of the first that has ever competed in America here. Uh, he was alive until 2010 when he passed away of liver cancer. So... Sadly, that's what happened. This documentary, if you haven't seen it, it's on his uh, channel, Yemwa the Bull, or you can actually find it on Luva, his channel too. And it's a beautiful documentary that they did about his life and about how he inspired so many other Hmong fighters out there. The era that we're in right now, it's very different when he was growing up. And so I want to point out some things and I want to kind of review some of the things about this documentary. And I'm not going to play the entire documentary. I think it's like an hour long. So I'm not going to play the entire documentary, but I am going to cut to some points and then I'm going to play it and we're going to talk about it. Okay, so here we go. Next, in proving how one person can potentially bridge nations. So this is the beginning of the bowl. I'm going to play a little bit of it, but I'm then I'm going to jump to uh, some spots that I want to kind of talk about, okay? Kung Fu school is not known for kickboxing or, you know, unlike Muay Thai and stuff like that. I think at that time, I've been fighting for a little while already, but Yeah came in, he wanted to fight. And I remember asking him, hey, Yeah, why do you want to fight? What's go what, what happened? You know, I remember one thing he said specifically, he goes, I want to fight to make the Hmong people proud. I know Hmong people can fight. I'm like, what difference does it make? I mean, Hmong, Lao, Vietnamese, Cambodia. Now, he really was stuck up. <clears throat> Now, one thing with what he said there, why he wants Hmong people to fight or compete and why he believes that Hmong people can fight. Hmong people can fight. Okay, so going out to all the people out there, Hmong people can fight. You see them fight at tournaments all the time. <laughs> you know, just be on top of that, they have a lot of passion for what they do. And if you don't believe it, you just watch all the talent the talented Hmong people out there, the soccer players, the gymnasts, the dancers, the martial artists, the, the sport players, the athletes in the Hmong community, they have so much talent out there. But I think the one thing with them is that a lot of them give up along the way due to the support that we get in our community. There were times when he did feel a little bit pigeonholed being Hmong. Like, oh, you're going to fight Muay Thai in Thailand, but you're not Thai. He never let it break his spirit, for sure. In fact, I think it motivated him a little bit. Moore has two California kickboxing titles, two national titles, and he just got back from Thailand where he beat out all the West. And that's a big deal since some of the best kickboxers are from Thailand. The sport originated there. So with this... It's just not him being in Thailand that is the only Hmong that competes. I think during this era, him in America, he was the only Hmong that actually competed in Muay Thai. I know there was a few others, but they never got big out there because they never redeemed themselves. And you'll hear that later on in the documentary. Uh, one guy actually did compete, but he lost and he never came back to redeem himself. But yeah, kept coming back and coming back. And that was that was why he was so important. That's why he was such a he played such a significant role in the Hmong community. It was because he would lose, he would come back and compete again, and he'll win and then continue winning, lose, come back and compete again to win. And so not just in Thailand, he was the only Hmong, but over here in America, he was the only the only Hmong guy during his era there. So I, I know that that really does play a factor because um, I can relate to that. When I started competing, I was the only Hmong guy at the gym. And 
besides my instructor who was half Hmong, half Caucasian. Other than that, I, I, that was the only one. That really plays a significant role on the character that Yil Mo had. As you can see, he, he really stepped out of his boundaries. He stepped out of his, his box and he really went out there to do what he loved. Like, I think it's easy, like, if a person becomes famous, oh, uh, I, let, let me associate with the new people. I, I, I don't think he was like that. He didn't change. He was the same. He wanted to do more, even more for the community afterward. Yeah, he changed in that sense. He was getting more involved. He had uh, um, started making some movies, and he was selling them at the New Year. Every single year, when I passed by his booth, even though I try to hide my face because I don't want to bother him because he's such a busy guy. Nope, he stopped what he's doing, come over, give me a hug. Friendship was always bigger than, than, than the fame or you know, everything else that he got from fighting. You know, the way that we interacted and what we did uh, was kind of removed from him being famous. And he really enjoyed that, right? I mean, because we saw each other kind of less and less over the years, but we still were very tight every time we got together. So that's one thing with uh, Yeah Moore. He was the type of person who would never forget who or where he came from. And that type of character is very rare. Most of the guys, when they make it up there or they make it to the top being champion or world champion, they, they tend to never really come back. And so Ye Mo was not that type of person. And also, he was Hmong. And so that's the type of character that Ye Mo kind of brings into this documentary and into this, uh, into this world before he passed very generous, very kind, always wanting to help the community. And it just, it's just such a sad thing that a man like this, you know, has to leave this world so, so soon. My brother tried everything. He picked up playing drums, My brother played guitar, he played piano, he didn't sing, he was horrible at singing. He always thought he was a rapper. And he was like, why don't we make a rap group? Like, what? <laughs> They're like, make a rap group. Like, what, what? We're in the back of my dad's truck, and I just remember, we got to come up with the name. Yeah, it was so quick like this, too. He goes, three to play. I'm like, what? There's three of us, and we love to play. So call three to play. So if you haven't uh, seen Yeah's, his uh, YouTube channel, they actually have some of their videos that when they went to uh, the, the church, because I believe Yeah was Christian, and they would go rap at church. The rap music was not bad. <laughs> it was actually pretty good. It was him, his sister, the one speaking was Capri. That's his sister. She is uh, trying to carry on the legacy of Yia Mua, her, her brother. And then um, this this uh, is their brother-in-law. And he's part of the rap group too. So they have some really good rap. It's, it's actually funny, but it's, it's really good. And I thought that was just amazing how I went on there watching it, and it was it was quite inspiring too. Just the music that they were coming out with. Ultimately, martial art means honestly expressing yourself. To express oneself honestly, not lying to oneself. That, my friend, is very hard to do. And you have to train. You have to keep your reflexes so that when you want it, it's there. When you want to move, you're moving. And when you move, you are determined to move. Not, not anything less than that. I could see in Yia's face, even though he didn't say it, sometimes he would put on a mask. The business he was in is not an eight to five business. It's a 24 seven business. You know, and I think to be able to juggle that successfully, it takes a supportive family. It takes a supportive significant other that realizes what his commitments are. Our work reflects our experience of life. It's kind of like when you're chasing your craft, you're chasing your demons. The whole essence of just creating and finding things, like you're wandering into unknown territory, like the black hole, right? <laughs> and then you have to weigh that against your family. The best fight I remember of Yes' fight was uh, not the one that he won, but the one that he lost. It wasn't the fact that I remember him losing, but I remember the people that went to cheer him on. He was disappointed that the people left. He was more hurt about that than, than him losing. Uh, in Chinese, they would call that like uh, wine and meat friends. You're doing well, I share wine and meat with you. Mm. That, that's wrong. 
the people you, you want to support you when you lose. That's important too. We were still there for him. We definitely had some times where we had losses. He actually tore a quadricep muscle in the middle of a fight. So I'm wanting to meet friends. Let's talk about that. I think we all have those friends. Uh, they come and go. But for a person like Yeah Moa to be in the spotlight quite a bit, you are going to have a lot of white meat friends. And that's pretty common because most of the time people don't know you. They only know you as a, a fighter, as a martial artist or uh, entertainer. So when you come out there to perform, you're just coming out there to do your performance and you win, they support you. They'll be there. They'll probably hang out, drink with you. But if you lose, it, it tends to take a different turn. And it's it's common. It's not it's not something that is uh, un, unnatural. It's normal. <laughs> People tend to not know tend to not know you when you lose. And I've I can completely relate too because I've I've lost fights before, and that is why I don't invite anybody I know to fights. <laughs> People depend a lot on my brother. You know, people thought he was making money. You know, the promoters was making more money. Did he get any revenues? No. And if he did, it was a little chump change. A lot of these guys that compete, we do not make money. We barely scratch the surface on money. And on top of that, you got to pay your promoters, you got to pay your your coaches and your gym fees and your expenses. All that adds up. So eventually, when you're bringing home money, you're only bringing probably the most, the most. <laughs> I don't even want to put a number on it because everybody gets paid differently. I'll tell you that if you watch my video where I talked about how much I get paid, you will know. And for Yemua, I know he did not get paid that much. I know, okay? So it's very sad. It's very sad, too. Doing this kind of lifestyle is going to take a lot of support. And if you don't have support, you're more than likely going to fall through. At the age of 28, Moore will compete in a kickboxing tournament. Yeah, I ain't considered like an old man in the sports. Most of his competitors will be 18, 10 years younger than Moore. For me, he wasn't happy. And I knew that. We, we love what we do. We focus, focus so much on our work that sometimes we neglect our own kids. We don't neglect our own family because we want it so bad. You know, there was times where we talked about possibly me and him moving in together. Just for a period of being able to, for him to clear his mind, he'd always talk about, you know, you have to make sure that your significant other is with you, on board with everything you're doing, because he also said the number one killer of dreams can be your significant other. That's so funny. They actually played Tompa Fu in there. Um, it's a really funny Stephen Chow movie if you haven't seen it. But uh, it, it is it is very true. I would be lying if I said that my wife and I don't have problems over my competing. When I was competing again back in 2018, uh, I worked extremely hard and I was always at the gym. She never really saw me very much. And I was losing a lot of weight very, very fast too. And so, of course, she's going to get insecure. And this stuff happens all the time. Because they want a man to settle down, a man to be around with the kids and be around with them. For me, it was at the gym, training, and then coming back home, training at home, and then going upstairs, eating dinner, showering, and then going to bed, repeating the same thing. And of course, trying to spare some time for my kids and my family. So family was like second. Training and competing was, was number one. And it really does play a factor on your relationship because you that's like your job. That's like your livelihood. So you got to try to try to make it. And when you're putting so much time into that, you're getting out there. People are going to see you. Everyone's going to know you. Sometimes when you get out there so much that wherever you go, you get kind of swarmed by people. 
Uh, that hasn't happened to me, thank God. That's one thing that has you have to really balance, and that is one thing I know that Yeah struggled in, especially the fact that he was a damn good looking guy too. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, he he was a damn good looking guy. So he's gonna have that. You know what I mean? <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but yeah, let's let's continue. We had one drink. He's like, well, my ulcer's acting up again. Well, it wasn't his ulcer. It was the cancer was pushing his renal artery up into his stomach. And so the blood was pouring into his stomach. That's when we found out that my brother was diagnosed with liver cancer. I remember this when they came out in um, 2010 and I was in Arkansas during this time and it was really really sad because uh, I think the whole community the whole Hmong community kind of heard about this he was such a big icon in the Hmong community that when we found out he had cancer, he was going to go, uh, the, all the Hmong people kind of felt the impact. And it was really sad because he was a real inspiration to a lot of us. You know, we, nobody really wanted to see this happen, but um, when we heard about it, it was, it was just bad news. And a lot of people wanted to just try to um, ignore it because they believe it probably would go away, but this was a terminal illness that he had, and um, they came out to ask for help for just a little bit to help him with his um his his bills and everything. And um, I don't I don't know how much he got, but all I know is that he didn't make it. <laughs> He said, I'm looking forward to it, towards Ucha travel. But he said it in a tone where. So I'm not going to um, get very deep into this part because I still kind of get very deep into this part because I still kind of choke up when I watch this. So uh, I'm just going to kind of talk about it, and um, I, I want to go to a part where he expresses his feelings so you guys can hear what he's had to say, and uh, I, I really just want to talk about that part. This, this is really emotional, especially the fact that if you put yourself in his shoes, it's, it's something that you can't ever imagine unless you've been through it, unless you were there. I remember my brother just looked, he goes, I remember my brother said that. And I said, why would you say that? You know, I was like, boy, you traveled everywhere, yeah. You drank, you traveled, you have fun, you make friends. You know, people, you're such an inspiration. But he was like, no, I did my life backwards. It was something more. No, I, I want to address this part because um, I think a lot of us don't really realize that we we are kind of going down that path. Uh, we see it all the time. We see it for these younger generation that are rising up, and they they really don't know what kind of path to lead because no one's ever showed them a path. I know for myself, growing up, I didn't have anybody to look up to. And so I kind of had to, I couldn't follow my father's footstep. He was, he was, he wasn't the greatest father. And sh sure enough, I had to find someone else as a role model and as a person that I could follow. And so I found my instructor and I chose to follow him. And as I continue doing that, I realized that my life started changing in many different ways. And so Someone like yeah, for him to come out and inspire others to stay away from that stuff, to get away from the gang violence and all the the bad things that are happening in this world, but stick to the right path and being a better person is very rare for us to see in the Hmong community, because most people don't come out and actually talk and express and and 
share what they know. They mostly come out just to try to benefit themselves. Uh, I, I do see that the generation that's coming up is, going, is having a lot of problems. We can only do so much, but a lot of it is out of our control because we try to reach as much as we can only through the sources that we have. His kids, his kids, I believe they don't never really had much time with him because he was always so busy and he was always doing what he loved. It's it's very sad just to see somebody that that gifted, that inspiring to leave this world so soon. I'm going to play a little bit more. And if you guys haven't seen it, please check it out uh, and watch the whole thing. And hopefully you guys remember to chase your passion. Remember to chase your dreams. A lot of friends came and shared their stories of what he had did. And, but he wasn't afraid to, to die. He told me he accepted. He said, I accept that I'm, I'm, I'm going. I hope you can see this. You've always wanted friends and you always wanted people to be around you. Well, you did it. And you wanted to know that you make an impact. Well, that day, and you can tell how much of an impact my brother made in people's life. He made so much. <laughs> Hi. 